Hi class, welcome to the fishes. Um, these are our first vertebrates that we'll be talking about. When you compare them to humans, um, fish are rather um, evolutionarily old or an, a more ancient type of organism. They're more basic. Um, and you'll, you'll see why as we go through um, some of the descriptions. So just so you can get the um, terminology correct, when you talk about fish, it's you can talk about lots of fish, but generally they're the same type. So the left-hand picture, this tank is full of fish, and then versus this ocean is full of fishes. Um, that means that there's more than one species that you're talking about. Okay, so we're looking at phylum chordata. This is where the fish belong. Uh, they have, just like all chordates, they have a notochord, pharyngeal gill slits, a dorsal tubular nerve cord, and a post-anal tail. Then they list a group, and the group isn't really part of the classification, but because they keep learning new things and adding new organisms, they find new evidence. This is a, another way that they're they're going to help categorize. Um, so all of the organisms in this group are going to have a skull that surrounds their brain, olfactory organs, which are for your sense of smell. They will have eyes and inner ears. I want you to add that somehow that got cut off on this slide. So an inner ear. Um, then we go down a little bit from phylum to subphylum, and this is hyperotreti. These are fish-like. They're not like true fish. Their skull has cartilaginous bars, um, so it's not a solid skull. They are jawless, so they don't have a jaw like we do. And they have something called slime glands, and an example of, a, of an organism here are hagfish. And then we'll go and talk about subphylum vertebrata. And for the vertebrates, this is where they have vertebrae that surround the actual nerve cord. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of history on fish and how they eventually evolved. Um, hagfish that we had just talked about previously are the most primitive living craniates. Um, the two craniate characteristics that they have are the brain and the bone. Um, and when you look back in the fossil record, you can see, or scientists have found, that 530 million years ago, they found a fossil that possibly had a brain. And then about 500 million years ago, they found bone in a group of fish called astracoderms. And this um, Astra relates to bone and derm relates to skin, so they kind of have a bony armor. Um, it's not an exoskeleton, they do have an endoskeleton. Um, but just to give you a little more background, if you take a look at this picture, you can see the first vertebrates were fish-like animals, uh, appeared more than 500 million years ago. The internal skeletons of these jawless creatures were cartilaginous, and they were rarely preserved. Um, cartilage doesn't preserve well as a fossil. The uh, strachyderms had bony external shields that covered their head and most of their trunk. Um, from, and they ranged from 3 to 10 inches long. They had uh, thick, flattened bodies, and they had like a pair of side flaps. They're not like true fins, and those would help them when they're steering. They probably swam clumsily just above the uh, sea floor, and their mouth served to obtain oxygen and um, bits of food. And then after the true fish appeared about 400 million years ago, most of these astracoderms became extinct. There was an armorless type, and that was the ancestor to hagfish and lampreys. Uh, some astracoderm plates are found in the Devonian bone beds in India, so that's where you can um, trace the ancestry of fish back to. Um, so fish are the first vertebrates. Um, the, their ancestors were probably the first um, marine vertebrates. I don't believe that the environment on land would really serve many vertebrates yet. Um, vertebrates did adapt to fresh water. 
and much of the evolution of fish occurred there. The ocean is a very stable system and you don't see evolution occurring in a stable environment. So in the freshwater systems is where you see evolution occur quickly. Um, early vertebrate evolution involved the movement of fishes back and forth between marine and freshwater environments, and there are still some species of fish that do this. Uh, the importance of freshwater in the evolution of fish is evidenced by the fact that over 41% of all fish species are found in freshwater. So almost half of the fish species on this planet are found in freshwater, even though there's very little freshwater on our planet. It, it's water as a whole, um, it, it only represents like a minute, you can see 0.0093% by volume out of all the water on the planet is freshwater. So that's a lot of different species in a very small amount of water. Okay, so let's talk about the hagfish. These guys are, they look like giant worms or like eels sort of. Their head has bar cartilaginous bars. Their brain does have a fibrous sheath enclosed enclosing it. They lack vertebrae. They do still have a notochord and they have um, kind of a supportive structure. It's not bone. It's more like cartilage that helps to protect it. They have, and you can see in this picture, the sensory tentacles around their mouth. And then they have these ventrolateral slime glands. And you can almost see them. Uh, they're kind of whitish they're on like the left side of the picture here, um, like little dots. And I will be showing you a video and you can see how much slime they actually produce. It's kind of, it actually looks kind of gross, but um, it's an interesting defense mechanism that they have. Just persuade one of these guys to come and say hello. And actually, if you look, you can see along the side, these tiny white holes, they look a bit like mouth ulcers actually. And that's where it makes the slime to protect itself. And you can see now why we needed such a big tank. Apparently just one of these fish can make enough slime to fill a bucket of water in seconds. So they, they produce a lot of this stuff just to make sure they don't get eaten by something else. I mean, it would put me off, to be fair. I'm not hungry. This is a lot of slime in here now. Oh. Now this might look pretty disgusting and to be fair, in fact, it is. But there's good reason why we're doing this, not just have a laugh at my expense, because it's, it's about the slime and it's about what the slime is actually capable of. It's probably time I got out now. Yeah. Let's get me out of here. It's, oh, oh, this is not at all pleasant. It's not nice. However, this stuff, disgusting as it is, is quite fascinating. I know it doesn't look much like spider silk, or feel like it. Oh! But that's because I haven't finished with it yet. To turn this into something that can compete with spider silk, I need to put it on my special hagfish slime hanger. Now, I think, a shower. What will the clothing of the future be made of? How about slime? I'm Anna Rothschild, and this is Gross Science. Hagfish are eel-like creatures that live on the ocean floor. They're ancient animals that don't have backbones or scales or even jaws. What they do have is slime, and lots of it. When they're attacked, they can release about a liter of slime, which clogs the mouths and gills of their assailants, making them unable to breathe. The slime is composed of two parts. There's mucus and thread-like fibers, and these fibers are special. They're thin and act a bit like super strong silk. So scientists think they could be a candidate for the next eco-friendly, high-performance clothing material. You see, common high-performance fibers like nylon and spandex are made from petroleum, 
but hagfish thread is made of proteins, which would make it a great renewable alternative if we could find a way to mass produce it sustainably. The issue is that hagfish don't breed in captivity, so we can't set up hagfish farms where we could harvest large quantities of their thread, which I know would have been really awesome. Instead, scientists are hoping to genetically engineer other organisms, like bacteria, to produce the fibers. Now, you won't be seeing hagfish clothing anytime soon, but the researchers think that one day we might have hagfish stockings or bulletproof vests or maybe hagfish yoga pants. And personally, I can't wait for a future where I could work out in the slime of an ancient sea creature. Ew. Got a question about hagfish or their slime? Let me know in the comments. And for more gross science, hit subscribe. All right, so these guys are found in cold marine habitats. They eat soft-bodied invertebrates, or they scavenge on dead or dying fish. Um, to provide leverage, they actually tie themselves in a knot and push the knot forward toward their prey, so their mouth is hanging onto the prey, and then they kind of push back with that knot, and they can rip pieces of flesh off of uh, whatever it is that they're trying to eat.